Hey, Pastor David here. Hopefully you can hear me okay. I know this is a little bit different video setting for our 10 minutes prayer time, but uh, unfortunately I found out yesterday afternoon that I have to enter COVID protocol. Uh, I do not have, I have not tested positive for COVID. Uh, I just was exposed to a person who tested positive uh, a couple days ago. Thankfully, I, um, my family and I uh, haven't seen anyone but that family that had uh, tested positive, so we don't have any concerns about having exposed anyone else. And uh, we're feeling great. We're just planning for uh, the ways we can do this quarantine well and hoping that no one in our family gets symptoms. So I'd appreciate your prayer on that. Uh, so I'm filming from our downstairs guest room, office, you might see some of Abby's painting stuff and plants behind me because uh, I won't be able to join you at worship this morning. Uh, I am praying for you and I'm excited to join uh, the live stream and uh, participate that way as Mike Albert opens Psalm 145. Uh, so I wanted to open Psalm 10 with you. It's going to be a different psalm than you're used to reading, but man, as I've been praying through the Psalms and thinking about God's character from the Psalms and letting the Psalms shape uh, the way I pray and think about God. This one caught me really off guard and really has been encouraging in the last couple days. Remember, with the Psalms, we're, we're putting together the world God's put us in and the word he's given us, right? So we're trying to, as a child of the Heavenly Father, talk with him, depend on him, as we live in the world, in the light of his world, uh, his word. And that's going to mean that we need, we want to see him work in his world, but it's also going to mean we want to see him work in us. And I think in Psalm 10, we have a mix of both of those things and some of the hope that his word is going to prevail because uh, I won't read the, the whole psalm for you. In fact, I'll let you, uh, if you want to take a second to pause and read it, it, it takes longer to read out loud uh, for our video time. So why don't you just take a second and if you're willing pause this video and then read that quietly to yourself so that you can be prepared and then um, and then I'll start referring to it. All right, go ahead and pause it right now. Okay, hopefully if you're back, I don't know if you uh, took a second to to read that, but I'm going to refer to Psalm 10 and the first words in Psalm 10 say, why the Lord do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Now, the psalmist may be where you and I can often feel um, that God is distant, or you'd at least like him to be more visibly present in your moments of suffering, your moments of struggle, in the thick of life, right? And he, ha he starts this prayer with that question. And as a pastor, I think I, I just want to make sure that I say this out loud. This is a common rhythm, rhyme, stanza in Scripture. And I don't hear it as a common prayer in our walk or the people I disciple or, or my friends in the faith. I don't hear uh, many of us allowing this to be part of our prayer. Maybe it is behind closed doors. Maybe it is privately or under our breath or even in our hearts. But one of the things I uh, I would like us to, as a church, do is regain the power and joy of prayer by regaining all of prayer. We often, I think, just leave it as a laundry list of, you know, where's the groceries, God? And not this right here, this relationship, like you've done with your wife or you've done with your husband or you've done with somebody and you've come to them and you said, things seem to be off. Are we okay? What's going on? Why do you feel distant? You know, what's, what's really, what's up, what's up, right? That's what the psalmist is doing here because prayer is not merely about circumstances and like deliverables. God, my Amazon order isn't here yet. Can you get it here? So look at the next thing. The reason he says this is because there is an arrogant, wicked person oppressing the psalmist. Okay? So it says, In his arrogance, the wicked man hunts down the weak, verse 2, who are caught in the schemes he devises. He boasts about the cravings of his heart. He blesses the greedy and reviles the Lord. So 
So not only does he oppose the weak, which is, um, which is wicked, but also it stands in contrast to what we just read in Psalm 9, where it says that the Lord will never forget the, the cause of the afflicted, and he hears the cry of the needy. So, so this wicked person is actually like in your face, God, while he's holding down and pressing against the poor and the needy, the exact opposite disposition. But he seems to just do, do whatever he wants. Verse 5 says, all his ways are prosperous. And his laws, he's rejecting the Lord's laws. He, he sneers at them, right? He, he says in his arrogance about this, this wickedness and arrogance, verse 6, look at verse 6. Nothing will ever shake me. No one will ever do me harm. So this, this kind of uh, escalation of the fact that he is wicked and bold about his wickedness and blasphemous about his wickedness. That's what's on the heart of the, the prayer here, the psalmist. And, and verse 10 uh, and 11, it's, it really catches some of the central pieces. His victims, sorry, air conditioning just came on if you could hear it. Uh, heat, not, not cold. Uh, his victims are crushed. They collapse. They fall under his strength. He says to himself, God will never notice. He covers his face and never sees. And I think this is the tension that the psalmist is wrestling with, where he goes, okay, I'm watching innocent and needy people fall crushed. And I'm watching arrogant and wicked people say, God doesn't see. That's the, that's the, the, the point of tension right here, the fever pitch. And, and that's maybe, you've been there. Okay, I know that there are that there are people who will, in our congregation who watch this video who have undergone serious evil. Sexual assault has happened to you and no one was ever held to account. The, uh, the sexual violence or domestic violence or, or someone stole from you or someone slandered you and no, <clears throat> no one ever made it right yet. I know that, that some of you are just grieved by the pervasive evil of our nation. And, and you look at things like abortion and you recognize that millions more people have been murdered in the womb than any other cause of death. It, it outstrips every other cause of death bar none. And you grieve because people chant in the streets in pride that we have this freedom to crush the needy. That, I mean, that's honestly what comes to mind first for me. And I, I know that there are those of you who have vivid personal memories uh, of, of being abused or, or be, being on the receiving end of violence that come to mind in this. But also, uh, and I know also that there are those of you who have had abortions and I and I want you to know that even while we lament the, the sinfulness and wickedness of abortion, that doesn't mean there's not room for you to lament with us. The, the cross is full of sinners repentant about their own sin and calling for God to end a world of sin, to bring justice. There's grace and mercy. So what does the psalmist say in this tension? Verse 12, Arise, Lord, lift your hand up. O God, do not forget the helpless. He calls out to God and says, you are the one I need to bring, that needs to bring justice. When you see the, the trouble of the afflicted, God, you consider their grief and take it in hand. The victims commit themselves to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked man. Call the evildoer to account for the wickedness that would otherwise not be found out. Do you hear this? This is... The psalmist looks at the two problems, the crushed wicked and the arrogant, blasphemous, bold oppressor. And he entrusts both to God. God, you're the one who helps the needy. Help the needy now. God, you're the one who brings justice. Bring justice now. Break the arm of the wicked. And I, I, uh, I think that this is a category of prayer I'd like to see recaptured in our lives. Not that we're thinking of specific people like, Lord, break their arm. Give them, a, you know, an arm bar and UFC style, just snap that boy. But, but to say, Lord, would you undo 
Planned Parenthood? Would you crush the <clears throat> the the people who are lever leveraging and lobbying? Would you dismantle their agenda for abortion? Make every abortion clinic in the country go bankrupt and empty out. Cause this vile injustice to end. Maybe there are other things like uh, like racial injustice or uh, political uh, political decay. There are things that come to mind or personal harm that you felt. What the psalmist does is he says, God, God, you hear what he's saying about you, that you're not going to hold him accountable? Show him a sign of your justice, which really could be a sign of mercy. We could pray for mercy in the evildoer because we know that uh, that to be, see immediate consequences for our sin is a flash, flashing warning sign that says there will be eternal consequences for our sin. So God, break, break the hearts of the the leaders of of Planned Parenthood or some other wicked organization, and and show them mercy to repent before it's too late. But maybe you think about uh, others, and 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 I would just say this. What you don't see the psalmist do is make a plan of attack himself. He embraces the power of the king, the mercy of the king, and he offers in prayer this injustice and the plight of those who are victims. And that's what we need to do, is we need to take up prayer on behalf of the victim. We need to take up prayer on behalf of those who have been unjustly uh, unjustly treated. And and then celebrate the fact that there will be a day when we will definitely see the Lord's justice. Look at the final verses. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations will perish from the land. So these people, you, Lord, hear the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them and you listen to their cry, defending the fatherless and the oppressed so that mere earthly mortals will never strike terror again. I don't know what fear and terror you face, or what comes and grips your heart in thinking about this. But the Lord is the King who reigns forever. And it may be taking longer than we desire, but His justice is coming. Let's pray and call out to Him persistently, for He's the one who loves the fatherless, the oppressed, and He's the one who will hold the wicked to account. Thanks for joining me for prayer this morning.